eating. Um, what they do is when they recognize a substrate, the substrate binds on the interior side of the cell membrane. The protein undergoes a conformational change coupled to the exchange of energy. Sometimes this is a proton motor force, the proton gradient being resolved, sometimes it's ATP. And that allows the toxic compound to be extruded from the cell. In hypothetical bacteria cell number one here, you have a small number of efflux pumps represented by this little Pac-Man looking shape. You have the antibi antibiotic diffusing into the cell and building up to a high concentration because the small number of pumps cannot keep up with it. In hypothetical bacteria cell number two, over here we have a large number of efflux pumps. So we still have the same concentration of antibiotic outside of the cell. It's still diffusing into the cell, but the efflux pumps are kicking it out the back door faster than it can build up. So bacteria cell number two will never will not die and it's not susceptible to this antibiotic because the intracellular level of this antibiotic is kept to a subtoxic concentration. This is important for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that this is one of the four big reason, four big mechanisms by which bacteria evolve antibiotic resistance. Not the only one, but it is an important one. So that gives this some potential clinical relevance at some point in the undefined future. I'm not doing drug discovery per se here. Um, this also has some ethnobotanical relevance because when you combine an efflux pump inhibitor with a compound that is an efflux pump substrate and is an antimicrobial, and one of the ones we've worked with in the lab is berberine, which is a well-known natural product, um, that combination will have a synergistic interaction. So you can have a plant which has no antibiotic activity, no antimicrobial activity in and of itself, but if it has an efflux pump inhibitor, combining that with an antimicrobial plant will have a synergistic effect. It will be greater than the sum of two. The history of this, this is just a literature review and two bullet points. There have been a number of studies on this on this activity. 26 genera have been studied that have been shown to be positive for this. One gymnosperm, 25 angiosperms. And not done in a way that you can provide any taxonomic context to the prevalence of this activity, which is what I want to do. And about half of the compounds which have been implicated in this activity are flavonoids. And this is quercetin, a very common flavonoid, and you can see the basic carbon backbone there. The hypotheses that I'm using are firstly that, this is what I want to test, that the production of efflux pump inhibitors is the primitive condition of land plants. If that is the case, then every land plant has had the opportunity to inherit this activity and the absence of activity would be a reverse mutation. And secondly, from the prevalence of flavonoids in the literature, that this activity will be linked to, will be commonly linked, they're not the only things that are seen, but that will be commonly linked to the occurrence of flavonoids. Um, the study group I have chosen, uh, seven plants, three angiosperms, these are closely related to some of the ones that already occur in the literature, they're in the Ranunculales. Uh, one gymnosperm to supplement the gymnosperm that's already in the literature, two fern allies, and marchantia. I am using only leaf material, except for the marchantia, which you can see here. We, there's no good way to separate the photosynthetic material from the whole fast, so smush the whole thing. Process, most of the plants that I'm using have been wild collected from private property with permission of the landowner. Um, the, Material is dried. Two, one was obtained through a local wildcrafter. Two were just outright purchased. The Marchandia, the liverwort is one. Um, one of those. In all cases, regardless of how it's obtained, the material used in research is dried and doctor specimens are also preserved. Crushed up, stuck in a flask or a percolator, extracted in methanol. The methanolic extract is then cleaned by partitioning it against hexane. This is to scrub off the fats and waxes. Not really interested in them, and they can confound chromatography, so we want to get rid of that. 
than taking the methanolic fraction, moving it over, diluting it with water, and partitioning against chloroform. The water washes primarily to get rid of tannins, which can confound many bioassays. And then the chloroform gets most of the interesting medium polarity molecules, wrote it back down, and then used an experimentation. All of the experiments done have been done in a 96 well played format. I am doing multiple bioassays. I only have time in a 15 minute presentation to go into one. And this be it. It's a fluorescent assay. We're taking an aliquot of bacteria. We're exposing it to athenium bromide. Athenium bromide is it's an antimicrobial. It's not a clinically relevant antimicrobial. But it has two very useful properties for this assay. One, it's an efflux pump substrate. Kind of essential. The second is that it fluoresces in the presence of DNA, but not in the absence of DNA. So as it diffuses into the cell, encounters DNA, it, uh, it acquires the ability to fluoresce. When it's outside the cell, it doesn't. So we can use fluorescent intensity and change in fluorescent intensity in a well to directly measure the intracellular content of this antimicrobial. This is a 30 minute time series prepare everything, move it to another room where my plate reader is, quickly squirt in the athidium solution as quickly as humanly possible, hit go, measure for 30 minutes. This first plot is time. This is with the, my control molecule, which is piperine, and um, good, uh, a good efflux pump inhibitor published before. It's an alkaloid from black pepper. And you can see at the blue line here at the bottom, that's broth. At broth and low concentration, there's a small increase in fluorescent intensity over the 30 minute time frame, not much. But then we get in subsequent higher concentrations, a dose dependent increase in the final concentration. A more convenient way to plot this data is to just take the last data point from each of these runs and plot it concentration of analyte, in this case still piperine, against fluorescent intensity, and we can get out this nice um, dose-response curve. Works beautifully for a pure compound. When we throw crude extract at it, we have one problem. Athidium bromide fluoresces in the red region. Plants like to absorb light in the red region a lot. So we commonly see this sort of condition here. We, at low concentration, we have an increase in intensity and then a drop-off and at the highest concentration of crude extract, signal's dead. And we've done some spiking experiments with piperine in combination with various concentrations of plant extract to show that this is um, a signal suppression effect. It's not a real impact on the protein. So this is a challenge. It prevents the conclusion of a true negative result because here, this interrupted fern, Osmonda claytonia, there's this tempting little thing, but we can't say anything about that. This looks inactive, but we don't know whether that's inactive because it's truly inactive or inactive because the quenching effect is hiding the activity. So this one we can call active because we clearly have an increase here as well, here as well. This just has to be left as ambiguous. To show the, how the data falls out on my data set, the green arrows are some level of activity which is clearly statistically significant. The yellow arrow is ambiguous. So all but one of these have shown activity, and this is just a reminder that we cannot demonstrate a definitive true measurement of inactivity. So all but one work. Next up is addressing the second hypothesis of is efflux pump inhibitory activity in some way linked to the prevalence of flavonoids. Doing this with mass spec, we have a very nice electrospray coupled, electrospray, electrospray ion source coupled with high res mass spec um, and an ion trap in it, so we can do a lot of experiments with that. We cannot truly identify a diverse array of unknown flavonoids because we cannot possibly buy an analytical standard for each one of them. But we can have a few exclusion criteria, and I'm getting a little short on time, so I'm not going to go through all of these. But we can process data by looking at the peaks, excluding them as not a flavonoid, or 
including them as a possible flavonoid or by, and also by looking at the fragmentation pattern, possibly even a probable flavonoid. So some of this data was done in collaboration with one of the undergrads, Pat, here in our lab, who wanted to work on some bioactivity direct fractionation, working with xanthorrhiza extract, which was another one of these ambiguous ones at first. He did uh, fractionation with flash chromatography. And this is the exclusion criteria applied to one of the early fractions and one of the late fractions. The late fraction having no possible flavonoids, the earlier fraction having two. And we can see that we get a difference in the quenching response. Here is all of, and this is typical of the first three fractions, this plot, where all we see is quenching effect. The later plots, we see very little of anything. The middle ones get more interesting. First, we have a whole bunch more of these possible flavonoids, fraction four, five, and six. And we start to see a little, little tempting hint of activity, not real great yet. Fraction five gets a tad better. Fraction six is pretty darn good. And Pat is going on with more fractionation. Five and six have been combined. I've been emailing with him since I've gotten to this conference about what to do next on this. So um, he's, good. he's planning to go all the way to pure compound on these. <clears throat> Conclusions. Efflux pump inhibitory activity does appear to be incredibly common in land plants. We can't say that it's uh, universal, but at least in this study group, it appears very common. From that, we can say that this data supports the hypothesis, especially since the Marchantia was active, supports the hypothesis that this may in fact be the primitive condition of land plants. And those very preliminary results I showed you with the flavonoids being linked to the more active fractions, or the potential flavonoids being linked with the more active fractions, gives some preliminary support for the second hypothesis. Ongoing work, testing all of these uh, fractions again with a synergy assay that combines berberine and antimicrobial with, that is an efflux pump substrate with the plant extract in many combinations to observe and model synergy between them. And the preliminary data, I'll just as an aside, does agree quite well with what I've shown you already. And, and this is the last name of my PhD, which I will be starting upon returning to Greensboro, trying to refine some of the chroma chromatography to use smaller scale samples um, and go through it faster, collect a larger number of fractions uh, with less material and couple it right at the front end with an aspect before doing the experiment and kind of streamline some of the chromatography and testing for flavonoids. And that is the end of my talk. <laughs> We have time for a couple questions. Yes. So um, on, I, I understand your frustration with the quenching effect in your assay. Um, yes. Have you considered perhaps fractionating using cephalidex 20 That's often a very nice way to pull out flavonoids. So they'll stick to the column and separate almost a few times. Okay. I consider that. Flash chromatography is fine, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We were using flash chromatography silica gel. Yeah. Um, I've done that. I did. I don't have the data because it was incredibly inconclusive on the fern flash chromatography failed. So I have the, that ambiguous fern extract. I still have all the fractions, got to decide what to do with them. But that's a good idea, thank you. If the third aim doesn't work, I'll be looking for other things. <laughs> other questions? Adam, you're going yes. to be ne your next step is then to start doing combinations with different antibiotics and your mm -hmm. parts that you're isolating, or you because you mentioned berberine, but not these plants, or how? Uh, well, berberine is the control antibiotic. It's um, it's, a, it's an efflux pump inhibitor, though, not an antibiotic. Right? Well, it's an antimicrobial. Berberine is an antimicrobial. It's not an efflux pump inhibitor. Okay. We've shown that. So berberine is the antibiotic, or sorry forgive me biologists in the room, antimicrobial. Um, and it would be combining, it, it takes, the synergy assay takes four 96 well plates to do one complete assay. And you run from 
this is all done in a serial dilution format, mm -hmm. starting at 300 parts per million, then cutting it twofold each dilution. So you run berberine across the uh, uh, across the down the rows from low to high, and plant extract across the columns from low to high. So you get eight concentrations in all possible combinations, and then you observe a change in the MIC of the antimicrobial. Okay. And then you use that data, the, the change in the MICs of berberine to model center. So. And the change in the MICs you attribute to uh, efflux pump inhibition. Well, efflux pump inhibition or the presence of other antimicrobials, like xanthorrhiza is itself a berberine containing plant. Let me go to this one slide, because the picture I have here is actually the synergy assay. Um, Here, so berberine is bright yellow, so you can see it increasing down, and then plant extract is dirty green increasing this way. Top two plates get bacteria, bottom two plates are control, so you subtract the background out of these, and then you measure optical density to obtain your MIC. Um, it, it may be interesting to look at functionally distinct antibiotics in combination with your, rather than just stick with one antibiotic, but do some different panels looking at different functional classes. True, but they all have to be an efflux pump substrate. That's the catch. I see. Okay. That's the catch. That's the catch. That's why. Okay. So, yeah, and that's why the, the synergy requires some mathematical modeling to detect mm -hmm. because okay. the, the xanthorrhiza, it, is, it does test positive in the synergy. That's what I have good data on. Okay. Um, it is active. It doesn't hit MIC itself at 300 parts per million. But it, you know, okay. so you have to distinguish between, is this an additive effect of the new traces of antimicrobial coming in from the plant, or is it a synergistic effect? Mm -hmm. The synergy suggests the presence of, of efflux pump inhibitors. Mm -hmm. Since berberine is an efflux pump substrate, substrate, additive effect would imply some other unknown, not even going to go into a mechanism, you know? Okay. Good. Thank you. We're going to take a short break. Uh, start back at 10.30.